I'm going to call this meeting to order because I see a quorum of the Regional School Committee. It's 6.30 um, on May 14th. And uh, I just wanted to explain why I am starting the meeting. Uh, the reason is that the first topic is reorganization. We have two members who recently joined the committee. And as such, um, as per uh, district policy, we're going to have a conversation about who it becomes the chair. And once that's done, I'll hand over my virtual gavel uh, gladly to whoever that person is, and they can identify the vice chair um, and likely maintain the secretary role um, for the region. And then the rest of the meeting can start in earnest. Are there any, so typically the process is that I just take nominations. Anyone in the committee can either nominate themselves or somebody else. I'll look for a second. I'm just gonna stop now because, um, oh good. CLO is on the live stream. Perfect. So she's just picking it up from there. Um, and um, and then uh, we'll take all nominations for chair and then we'll have a vote. Uh, it'll be, uh, because we're in a virtual meeting, it'll be a roll call vote. Uh, and then the chair will, will take it from there. Are there any process questions for me before we start this process? Seeing none, uh, I'll take any nominations for chair. If there are any nominations for chair. I nominate Alice McDonald. Okay, so Ms. Spitzer nominated Ms. McDonald. Um, is there a second? I, oh, go ahead. I saw Miss Lord second it, uh, probably just where she is on my grid uh, first, but um, I saw Miss Lord second it. Before we uh, open it up, just Miss McDonald, are you open to that nomination? I am. Okay, thank you. Um, are there other nominations for chair of the Regional School Committee? Okay. So at this point, not seeing any, it'll come to a vote. Again, it's a roll call vote. So I'll start with Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Uh, Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Uh, Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer. I'm going to come back to Ms. Stancer um, as she works on her device. Mr. Demling? Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And it looks like Ms. Stancer is not able to vote at the moment, but we have a still have a quorum and we still have a majority. So Ms. Mc, oh, Ms. McDonald. I'm sorry, I didn't give you the chance to vote on that <laughs> either. My apologies. I'm not very good at this chair thing. <laughs> McDonald, aye. Okay, very good. Um, so I'll hand the virtual gavel over to you um, to uh, for a similar process around identifying a vice chair. Okay. Um, does anybody um, have a nomination for vice chair? I'd like to nominate Ms. Dancer. I'll second that. There, um, um, before we go, uh, Ms. Stancer, are you um, open to that nomination? Oh, we've lost Ms. Stancer. Oh, then she's definitely it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's our policy, right? Yep. <laughs> Um, let's see, should we give it a moment for her to see if she can join quickly? While we're waiting, I did have a question. Um, do we have a secretary for the regional school committee? I know we have one on other committees, but I'm not familiar with that. Dr. Morris. So the secretary for the committee, uh, regional school committee, as opposed to the Amherst or Pelham committee is, um, the person you identify who takes minutes. Um, they don't have a formal role um, in terms of uh, other like Union 26 matters that you think of Amherst, 
Um, so that's typically the role and typically committee members have been very happy to have someone else um, play that role, but certainly if a committee member felt differently, then they could volunteer themselves. Um, why don't we um, see if there's any volunteers or nominations for secretary while we're, um, and then come back to vice chair if we have our candidate. <laughs> So seeing none, do we um, do we nominate CLO to to as our as our secretary? I'm seeing head nods. Um, do, does that need? I'm going to go go for a vote on that as well. Um, so uh, uh, welcome back, uh, Ms. Stancer. We're voting on secretary right now. And we've uh, we've nominated um, CLO to continue um, in that role with, for us. Um, roll call vote, uh, Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Uh, Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Uh, we'll come back to Ms. Stancer. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. Okay. Um, and is uh, Ms. Stancer, are you able to to unmute? Can you hear me? Oh, Mr. Menino, welcome. We are um, we are voting on um, on the nomination of CLO, but uh, I think we we have a, a majority vote already, so um, that passes as long as CLO is is open to accepting that role. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Mr. Okay. Mignot, can you hear me? Yes, I, I'm going to, I can't get in on the computer. I'll have to join by phone. Okay. Um, Ms. Stancer, are you able to unmute yourself or no? No, okay. Uh, sort of, should we come back to vice chair nomination later? Yeah, okay. Um, so moving on, uh, we'll circle back if, if the rest of the committee is okay with that. Um, uh, after with, with, uh, maybe after the superintendent update and if, uh, if she's still having trouble, then we'll move it to the end of the meeting. Um, so our first order of business is to approve our minutes from April 28th, our meeting on April 28th, and those were included in the packet. I did note one um, one change um, in item number one in the call to order. Um, uh, it says Bethany Seeger is joining us from Pelham. Um, I, she should it should be Leverett. Mr. Demling, um, just on the first page header where it says meeting of the Amherst School Committee, it should either be regional school committee or joint of the Amherst Pelham and region. Correct. Also in attendance, um, I believe Ms. Seeger is also noted there as being from Pelham, should be Leverett. Are there any other changes, Ms. Seeger? 
Uh, on page three under FY21 budget, that's bullet point F. Uh, my name is misspelled in there. It's the fourth sentence up from the bottom. Yep. Since I can't see, um, see you, Mr. Menino, did you, do you have any edits? No. Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to approve our minutes as, as with edits as noted. Is there a second? A second. Move by McDonald and second on the floor. Um, we'll call vote. Mr. Demley? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. No, Demley, aye. Mr. Harrington? Um, Mr. Menino, it might be helpful if you, if you mute on the laptop. Oh, there. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Did, Mr. Harrington, did you vote already? Yep, Harrington, aye. Okay. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? And that was Menino I. Menino I. Yeah. Ms. Seeger. Seeger I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer I. Uh, Ms. Stancer. No. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan I. Okay. So the minutes are approved. Um, eight, uh, zero, and one. Okay, so we'll move on to um, public comment. Um, and in this uh, virtualized uh, environment, we are accepting public comment by email um, and by voicemail, um, as long as it's submitted by 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Um, and as of today, we have two comments. Um, and one uh, one uh, was inadvertently left off of our last um, our last uh, meeting on April 28th. So um, it is a, a couple weeks old, but um, it's relevant tonight too. Um, so, Dr. Morris, could you display the two comments that we received?
Thank you. Um, oh, yes, um, CL is asking us to do roll call attendance, so I will do that um, now. Um, uh, so I'll call out uh, names in alphabetical order again, and please respond with present. Um, Mr. Demling. Uh, Mr. Demling, you're still muted. I'm going to go to Mr. Harrington. Harrington, here. Uh, Ms. Lord. Lord, present. Mr. Menino. Menino, present. Ms. Although I can't see a thing. Oh, Ms. Seeger. Seeger, present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, present. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, present. Uh, Demon, present, by the way. Ms. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ms. Dancer. Uh, Ms. Uh, McDonald present. For, almost forgot myself. <laughs> just looking. Is Ms. Stancer on the line and just muted? I think she's left the meeting. Um, okay. Um, but after after so many rounds of this meeting, this is the first time that we're having significant ch uh, technical challenges. <laughs> um, so uh, moving on to our next item, we have the superintendent's update. Dr. Morris. And uh, just about all my updates will, will be on the agenda. So I'll hold on them. But uh, while I know it's three minutes long, I actually would love to play a piece of music that our high school students led by Todd Fruth um, organized because I think it's, it's uh, in this environment, it's pretty amazing what uh, teachers and students are able to do um, I'll probably play about a minute of it. I'm not going to do the full three minutes, but um, uh, that'll be my uh, actual only update tonight, other than the things that are on the agenda, which I'll have full updates on. Um, but I think it's, it's, from my opinion, it's, it's pretty remarkable and certainly worth sharing. Something that I could never, ever do, either on the teaching end or the, the singing end. So I'm always amazed by it. That's my best update ever, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it, that thank you. That that I saw that the when it, uh, the other day, and it's it's pretty. It is pretty incredible what um, they're able to do. It was um, really inspiring. Um, great. Uh, next on our agenda is the um, chair's update. I don't have um, an update other than um, I'll turn it, open it up to committee members if you have any announcements that you would like to make. Not seeing any. Um, okay, so we'll move on since I'm, I, I'm still not seeing Ms. Stancer in the meeting, so we'll, we'll continue moving along. Um, Is Mayno in the meeting? Pardon me? 
Is Menino in the meeting? I believe he is. We can see you. Because I can't see a thing. I'm watching a blank screen. <laughs> so, um, so uh, moving on to our uh, new and continuing business, the first item is the FY21 budget presentation and hearing. So, uh, Dr. Morris? Sure, I'll start and then uh, Dr. Slaughter can, can certainly jump in. So, uh, I think the way to describe uh, where we are in terms of the budget and our current situation of the context, uh, the best uh, analogy I've heard is that um, sometimes you hear these analogies about a perfect storm. Uh, we had one two years ago at the region. For those of you who are on the region or actually just attended four town meetings, like Ms. Seeger, you might have remembered that was an interesting year, even though you weren't on the regional school committee. And, and that was a perfect storm. And the way that um, this one, I think, is being described accurately is we're just getting to winter. Um, we're not going to, this isn't a storm that passes quickly. This is going to be a multi year fiscal challenge uh, for every community in the Commonwealth and beyond. And so one of the things that we're trying to do, we're trying to think about is how do we uh, make the budget decisions that we're being pushed to make this year because of the, the crisis uh, and also keep our mind on the next couple of years uh, because it, this may not be the hardest year that we have. Uh, you know, uh, I actually bet that FY22 will be equally, if not more significant um, so adding to that level of uncertainty is uh, we have no sense at the state level of what our funding will be like. Um, I was at a meeting last Friday with the, a number of state legislators. Um, it was very helpful. And one of the state senators said their, their guess was that chapter 70 would be held constant from uh, FY20, which would be about a 40, 50,000 dollar reduction of our original budget. Um, and the, but that regional transportation, circuit break, or other lines could be affected more significantly. But the scope and scale is uncertain. It's further complicated by the federal government, which is right now going through some discussions about uh, whether to fund a relief package to support states. And, you know, you may have seen our governor uh, make really strong claims about what uh, he feels like Massachusetts needs to, to be able to function uh, effectively next year. And so that, that's still uncertain. Um, I do want to share, just because uh, everyone here is part of a municipal district as well as a regional district, one of the key differences is those state funding changes directly affect the regional schools. So at the uh, municipal district level, that all goes through the, munici the town. And I don't want to say that it's, it doesn't affect uh, the municipal districts, but it's, it's one layer removed, whereas a cut to Chapter 70 is a direct cut on the regional budget. It, there's not an intermediary, intermediary agent with it. Um, so th that creates a challenge. Additionally, um, we don't exactly know what school is going to look like next year. Um, this comes to no surprise, I'm sure, to anyone. Uh, there's task force now starting to work at the state level, um, trying to figure out what school will look like. So we have to be really cautious. And one of our principles that we tried to use was, um, you know, certainly seeing where there were places where there was natural attrition. Uh, maintaining our staff, that's both a uh, positive thing in terms of maintaining our excellent staff. It also has financial positive implications if we're able to uh, make reductions that take advantage of natural attrition. Um, but, you know, it is hard to plan for a year where we don't exactly know what that year will look like. Will students be in school? If they are, how many days a week? If everybody's in school, what would that instructional model look like? Um, how do we plan for rolling closures? All those variables are really unknown. So we're at May 14th, and uh, we need to have a budget passed by June 1st, uh, and that's what the towns have requested. Uh, an update on that is that the uh, all three towns now are looking at late June for their town meetings. I think the last time we spoke, Pelham was looking at May 5th or 6th, something like that. Uh, they're now at May 27th, or June, sorry, June 5th or 6th, and now looking at uh, June 27th, uh, thereabouts for their town meeting. Uh, there's some real questions about how town meetings can happen. Uh, in those communities, um, uh, I was asked by a town about hosting it in our school. I talked to the public health department and, you know, that won't happen in terms of having a large group of people uh, inside our school building from a public health perspective. But there's a lot of challenges ahead. Um, so our, our goal is to have what we think is a reasonable budget passed by June 1st, reasonable given the context. Uh, and we hope that the four towns in some way, shape or form can support that budget before July 1st, so we don't have to get to a 112th budget that the 
uh, state sets for us. Um, one thing that Dr. Slaughter and I heard today on a conference call is the state uh, itself will almost be putting itself on a 112th budget. It's, it's, it's unlikely that we'll have clear information before July uh, about the funding for the year that starts in July. Um, so one of the things you'll notice in our uh, budget proposal is it's, it's essentially a, a level funded proposal for the overall budget. Um, there were some challenges how to display that because we're assuming some, some, div some level of state cuts. We don't know whether that's the right number or the wrong number, but um, you know, we had to adjust for that and, and we had to take uh, our best guess at where we are knowing that uh, we haven't touched our contingency funds um, that we put in our budget every year. And if it's significantly worse, we'll have to come back to this group to have that conversation. Um, I'm gonna, before we get into the specifics of it, I just wanna turn to Dr. Slaughter to see if he, and the committee after Dr. Slaughter, if there's uh, some contextual questions before we get into the actual revisions that we'd like to present tonight. So I don't, um, I mean, I think the, you know, Mike has covered, the, I mean, uh, Dr. Morris has covered most of the salient broad points that we have, which is there's a lot of unknowns. Um, so we're trying to uh, kind of block things in, in big uh, ways to try to identify those those areas. And, and you'll see that in, in the subsequent stuff that we present. But uh, other than that, I think he's captured most of it. So before I, I move forward with the actual data, Dr. Slaughter and I, both on the operational side and the capital side, I just, I didn't know, I didn't want to dig in until uh, given the, without giving the committee an opportunity to ask any questions um, that are broader than the specific budget proposal. Ms. McDonald, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> now I couldn't find my mouse. Mr. Demling and then Ms. Seeger. Um, so do we have any broad guidance yet from any of the four towns with regards to capital? It's it's so it's it's such a different decoupled thing at the region. Uh, I was just wondering how we, what what your assumptions were in terms of levels and amount um, prior to putting this together. So uh, I will partially answer that question, but that'll come up a lot in the actual presentation. Uh, the the short answer is, folks ask for less capital, and it's super complicated because of the regional agreement. And you did, I mean, I think a additional context piece um, is a budget was passed, both operational and capital. The operational one legally is not as complicated to change as the capital one. Um, so there, there's both uh, how much capital can towns afford given the context, but there's actually some logistical challenges because you, you all did pass a, a capital budget and there's language about X number of days if no one votes against it, it goes into effect. So I think if it's okay with Mr. Demling and the committee, I think that one will be best answered in context. Ms. Seeker. I just wanted to mention that I listened to our select board meeting the other night and they're talking about the possible date of June 20th for town meeting with a backup date of the 27th. And some of that depends on, can we find a space large enough to accommodate, uh, I think 150 plus people in a socially distanced manner. So they're working on the complications of figuring that out. Probably the same as Pelham. Yeah, and I've had conversations actually with both towns. Um uh in the last pelham about a week week and a half ago and leverett yesterday and today uh about that matter and the short story is um from you know while the region owns the land it's still operated under the amherst uh board of health or health department and um it's not advisable i had my own uh kind of lay perspective of being uncomfortable with it i'm sure mr harrington wearing his other hat probably has some some thoughts on the matter, but um, the Amherst Health Department uh, very clearly uh, delineated that having large groups of people together, uh, even six feet apart, is not something that we're going to do. And, and I'll be very frank, and I said this in the email to folks who are asking, it's not something we're looking to do in the fall either. Um, so let alone where we are in May and June, uh, I'm always hoping that students are back in the fall and that we're able to get closer to normal. Uh, we're not going to have large groups of staff or students uh, together in auditoriums like like we have in the past, regardless. And and to their credit, both both communities are very understanding about that. And um, I think there'll be a lot of communities looking to do outdoor town meetings. Uh, and I think um, we'll see if those uh, R three communities how they consider that. Um, you know, my own personal 
public health perspective, uh, that probably is advisable uh, from what people who are more knowledgeable than me say. Okay, if there aren't other questions, what I thought I would do is um, display the budget documents. Um, I know it's gonna be hard to see because it's, it's a little small. Uh, one of the things I notice is when the replays show on television, um, it actually comes up uh, a little bit better, but let me get that screen up. Um, so I really wanna thank, let me see if I can make it larger. Okay. So I wanna thank Dr. Slaughter for um, some nice color coding uh, to explain where we are. So the reduction was about uh, $500,000 from the budget that was passed in March. Um, so when you see things with a yellow highlighting next to them, those are changes uh, from the budget that was passed earlier. They'll, further on, there'll be some X outs and I can explain those because we actually did make some different decisions, particularly from the public health perspective. So uh, the, uh, what I'm really gonna speak to are the things that are in yellow, that are the changes, and then obviously we can answer any questions along the way. Um, just one thing to note is I don't have my, uh, if I'm looking at the screen, I'm not seeing all of your faces. So if you have a question, um, you know, however Ms. McDonald wants to have it, but uh, I, people, I'm, I don't mind being interrupted, but if you raise your hand, I won't see you. Um, so um, just wanted to share that piece. So uh, for budget adjustments, um, one, the first one is to reduce the transfer to the OPEB trust fund. This is something the town of Amherst is also doing. Uh, we like having, good credits in our OPEB trust fund because that helps our borrowing and our credit rating. I think many communities are looking at uh, whether they have a year where they don't fully contribute to the OPEB. OPEB is other post-employment benefits. Uh, we've, we've been contributing to that the last couple of years. We have a trust fund. There are, um, so this isn't eliminating uh, funding it. It's just reducing our how much we would put in next year. Uh, the next one down is health insurance reduction because there are some staff cuts uh, and we assume a placeholder value for the health insurance that goes along with those. The next one down is alternative education programs for Summit Academy. So we have a number of students, we actually a new one today, who uh, from other districts um, who are interested in tuitioning in. Uh, we have done this before and it looks like we will have space next year. So this is, it's kind of weird to talk about as an adjustment, but it's that we assume we'll have more revenue from Summit Academy uh, than we had in the past. And particularly as we expanded it to a seven, eight model and including middle schoolers, it's become a very attractive one. I, I think that's actually a conservative estimate, but you know, if we get more students, what staffing needs have to go along with that, we'll have to work that out. Um, the next one down, um, prepayment of out-of-district tuitions. Uh, so on March 13th, when school closed, we also put what I'll loosely term a frost on the budget. I think we spoke about this when we did the third quarter budget. Uh, because we've been very conservative and we've had some cost savings, um, frankly, because of COVID and students not being in school, uh, from transportation, from athletics in the spring, uh, a whole variety of areas, and because we're, we're not allowing purchasing, uh, we're able to prepay the first three months of out-of-district tuitions uh, as per uh, Mass General Law. And so because we're in positive financial shape, we're able to do that uh, for $170,000. So um, that was, you know, when we were closing on March 13th, we, we knew that, we didn't know this was coming, but we knew there was gonna be problems ahead. And, and so I really wanna thank Dr. Slaughter for his quick thinking on that. Uh, the next two really are budget cuts, to be honest with you. It's uh, cuts to administrative lines for professional development and travel uh, and for consultant services. Uh, we've worked with our MSAN partners. Uh, I wanna thank MSAN for understanding the situation. Uh, frankly, it's unlikely MSAN events will happen much next year. If they do, it'll be a virtual environment, uh, much like the conversation about town meetings, getting the idea of getting a couple hundred students from across the country together in one physical location uh, seems inadvisable at best. And so they're working with districts to reduce fees uh, for the next year. Um, so that, that's the reduction there. It's not that we have any less commitment to MSAN, it's just frankly, there won't be the same kind of events uh, for MSAN. Uh, the next one down is additional use of school choice funds. It sends up about 14-ish percent of our, our school choice reserves. We have not done that in the past. Um, however, this year is a unique year and um, we're gonna need to start drawing uh, a little bit of funds from that source. Um, the next one down is the Federal CARES Act. So we, the state's application for the CARES Act was funded. Uh, we got word about a week ago that it was accepted by the federal government. 
It's slotted based on uh, the money that re districts receive is is almost exclusively based on uh, how much they get for Title I. Uh, there is an exception. Every district gets twenty thousand dollars. So for you know, some of the municipal districts uh, that some of you represent uh, that don't receive Title I funds, there is still funds coming to those districts. Uh, but for the region, it's two hundred thirty thousand dollars, which is eighty percent of our Title I uh, funds. Um, we are assuming a two hundred thousand dollar reduction in state support. Um, so that, that ends up being about 50 or 60 from uh, chapter 70 and the rest from regional transportation and circuit breaker. We don't know how real that number is. Uh, that's our best guess. I think there, there's reason to think it's a reasonable best guess. Dr. Slaughter and his professional organization have looked at uh, the recession 2008-9 and what happened to those particular areas. I think circuit breaker is going to be a harder one for the legislature to cut much of because it's been such a focus in the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, I do think regional transportation, we've already heard it from state senators representing primarily regional districts. Uh, that is a likely place where uh, it will, there will be significant reductions in the state budget. Um, so we'll have to see how it goes, but we wanted to have a placeholder to make this document real. Um, we'll see if the federal government really comes through as, as, uh, as some people are advocating for. Maybe these will be uh, more muted than what is listed here, uh, but no one really knows. And the reality is we're not going to know, not only in time for you all to vote a budget, but in time probably for the towns to vote a budget either. Um, you see the budget addition, uh, the math credit recovery at the high school. Um, we're going to shift that to our Title I allocation. So the, the credit recovery uh, course in mathematics that we talked about will still happen. Um, it'll just happen from our Title I and we'll reduce Title I in, in other ways that don't involve staff, don't involve staffing. Uh, we maintained our small $2,000 contribution to uh, environmental action analysis that would be along with the Amherst Public Schools and the town of Amherst. Uh, we'll see how that goes and what the town of Amherst does because if I think if the town of Amherst fails on it then um, it, it's going to be so, so small a number where it may not be useful but we're going to maintain that now because we think it's will actually pay for itself and it's consistent with the community values. So now we get to budget reductions so uh, we ended up uh, reducing the math curriculum training and support um, all of the appropriated share, uh, we would still keep uh, a small portion out of Title I uh, at the regional level. So it's not, uh, the position isn't completely gone, but it is more significantly reduced than the budget that was passed in March. Uh, it's a painful cut, um, but it is one of these things uh, at the secondary level that we do have um, curriculum leader, at the middle school, department head at the high school, and we'll still maintain some of this role uh, as we move forward. And I think given the uncertainty of exactly what instruction looks like next year, um, having more hands on deck at the secondary level, I think, um, you know, if it wasn't, if it was, if we didn't have budget challenges, I wouldn't be making this cut. I want to be really clear about they're proposing this cut. Um, but I do think it, it, I think we'll be able to, um, to weather that. Um, the only other, not the only other, but the two other reductions that are uh, in yellow that weren't already part of a budget that passed. Uh, one is that we have a, a 0.4 leave that was accepted for the art department at the middle school. Uh, that still allows for 1.6 uh, FTE or staff purple at a 430 person middle school in art. Um, class sizes will be still um, at or uh, similar to what they will be in the core subjects. So from a class size perspective, it's keeping things um, pretty consistent with what um, the classes that students would already be in. Um, and it, again, it was a way to, to look at attrition or at least temporary attrition uh, and make a decision that didn't involve um, someone's employment. And the last one is the middle school dean position. So uh, we've really, as the middle school has gotten smaller uh, in terms of student population, we've really increased the number of non-teaching staff at the middle school, I think for good reason. But next year we're slated to have a principal, uh, an assistant principal, um, a climate coordinator and two, two guidance counselors, two adjustment counselors. And really this is consistent with our approach around moving towards more restorative practices and restorative uh, elements in our school. And I think it, it happened that we had both a dean and a climate coordinator. And this isn't again about the people, they're both wonderful. It's about the, 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 you know, the roles that people play. I wanna be really clear about all of these reductions. Uh, they're not person specific. Um, they're really looking about uh, the role uh, and not the staff member. I think it's just important that we can't emphasize that enough that uh, we really can't look at individuals. It's really about the organization and what, what how the system can work 
uh, best for kids in the future. And we feel like uh, for a 30 person middle school, when we look at comparable size middle schools, uh, having that staffing, uh, non-teaching staffing is still consistent or even advise, uh, yeah, beneficial compared to many middle schools of that size. Um, so um, again, we don't, we don't like seeing that position go, but I think we can still uh, have our um, restorative approach at the middle school. We retain the climate coordinator and um, I think we can still have uh, the staff we need to run, a, run the school effectively. And so, um, as you see at the bottom, that gets us, um, the new reductions are $494,000. Um, so that gets us to um, a very, you know, within a couple dollars of a, a level funded budget, which is just, you know, sometimes the math doesn't work and you have to carry over numbers. And so it gets us essentially to level funded. So before we go to assessments and capital, I thought we'd maybe pause and see if there were questions from the committee or comments from the committee um, about any of these items. I, I, the last thing actually I should say is this was presented, this became a live document Friday night, uh, or excuse me, Tuesday night, sorry, my days are mixed up. And um, this was presented to all staff. Uh, they had an opportunity to view this as well on Tuesday because we always like that our staff have the opportunity to interact with uh, what we're gonna present, uh, what's becoming a public document. And, uh, we did the same in our other districts, so there are no surprises for staff members um, and individuals who saw their roles uh, or at least potential roles being listed on here had individual conversations so that they were uh, not surprised by what I'm saying tonight. Sorry, just I thought it was an important point both about uh, that this isn't about, you know, individuals or evaluative of any individuals. It's, it's about the system and that folks were told in advance. Um, Ms. Seeger? Just a clarifying question. Um, the lines that are yellowed but crossed out, is that a reversal of a Oh, cut? yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I totally skipped over. I'm sorry about that, Ms. Seeger. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out. So those were uh, reductions in the original that were taken out. So the, the, the math training and support, the PD, that one was just enhanced. Um, uh, and I don't mean in a good way, but the, the cut was uh, made greater. The world language cut actually was removed. And the reason that was removed is when we thought about the world language and we saw class size numbers, um, we, we got a little concerned. Um, and I think if it wasn't for, frankly, if it wasn't for the public health piece, um, we might feel differently about that. Um, but, uh, you know, we just can't be in the business of increasing class size um, beyond what they typically would be. Um, so it's not that one, you know, certainly there's instructional implications, but uh, that's why that, that reduction was removed from the budget. So I, I apologize for omitting that in my um, description. Uh, Ms. Spitzer, you had your hand up. Um, I had the same question, and I guess just one thing to clarify um, is when we're looking at the actual, I guess for lack of a better term, layoffs, is it correct? I mean, so we're not, so the art department, that is somebody who's taking a leave and so there won't be any um, actual loss there. Um, but the professional development, we're still keeping that person on, but they're gonna have a re reduced um, uh, workload I, I can't, or reduced schedule of going from a full one FTE to only, I guess it's 0.2 then, is that what? Yeah, I think I can talk to the staffing implications. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think. So it seems like the dean position and then that paraeducator role are the two where we potentially are losing um, actual st staff members who we need to notify before the June 15th deadline. Sure. So um, I just want to be cautious how I say this so it's less identifiable. because. So here's what I, I'd say. So no, 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 it's a good question. I can do it. I just have to catch myself. It's a super reasonable, I didn't mean it uh, as, a, as a negative comment about the question. So um, the paraeducator, we generally have enough uh, transiency within our paraeducator um, staff that we wouldn't, we wouldn't um, need to provide a reduction in force notice to anyone based on that. Um, and there's another district uh, that some of you work for that's adding paraeducators next year because of student need. And uh, in the past, uh, we've worked with the Amherst Pelham Education Association to make sure that um, people didn't end up getting a reduction in force in one district, and then we're hiring in another district for the same role. So that would not involve a reduction in force. Uh, the dean certainly would. Um, 
in terms of the mathematics, um, the position that the person was in, um, uh, that person has been in the district many years and that person wouldn't receive a reduction in force notice because of this. Um, that was a one-year position. So, you know, we were trying to extend it to more than a one-year position. So it, it potentially could have an impact on someone else who teaches in the math department. So a sum total would be, you know, less than two FTE, but it's still two people affected. So, you know, however you want to think about it, uh, which, you know, I will say, given the cut number of $500,000, um, some of the feedback I received is the numbers that uh, people were perceiving we would have would be more than one point one, you know, I'm just going to say two, because it's even if it's less than, you know, it's still two people getting a riff if notice. Um, so if if we end up going forward with this budget, it'll be um, two people who would receive um, that notice potentially. Thanks. I just, I guess my context just seems, is I think um, I would also, I know for those two individuals, it's going to be really difficult and I'd love to see the number be zero. Um, but I, I'm also pleasantly surprised that the number is not greater than that. I would love it to be zero, but it's, it's good to see it so low. Yeah. I agree. Mr. Demling. Um, yeah, just a general comment that I, I think your your point about FY22 um, potentially setting up as as a significantly more challenging time is is well noted. I mean, when I look at a couple of the numbers under the budget adjustments, and you have 170 grand for prepayment of our district tuitions, you know, that we were able to take and do early, it's certainly not going to be the case. <laughs> we can't expect that to be there next year. And then that reduction in state support is we can expect that to be uh, greater. Um, and so, it, yeah, it just really puts the point of emphasis on on the the, the federal and state um, uh, change in change in in either funding laws or uh, or, or stimulus. Um, one one last small question I had is on the um, alternative funding source. Is is that the the money from the UMass agreement? And do we have a sense of whether um, UMass, who's obviously uh, in their own COVID impacted budget situation, are, are they're still committed to that this year and in, in future years? Um, so the quick answer is no, we don't have confirmation, but the money that was slated to come to the district in FY, the current fiscal year, uh, we um, frankly aren't going to access in the current fiscal year um, because we don't need to. Um, so the way we did, and it gets to actually your earlier point, so that was a, a nice uh, nice way to segue to it, uh, is that we'll use uh, the FY20 and we'll, we'll receive that money on July 1st. And so the money that was slated to come to us this year will apply to next year's budget. And if UMass is able to continue to support it, then we'll always be paying it forward a year, which is actually a very advisable thing to do financially. Um, but I, I, you know, we had a loose conversation about uh, through the town of Amherst, who's the kind of mediating agent, uh, maybe three weeks ago. And I think like everybody else, they're trying to understand where their, where their budget is. I think that, I don't want to use an analogy or a metaphor for it. Um, so, but the money that they were planning to support us for the current fiscal year budget is they committed to that and that is not in question. And so we'll apply that to next year. Um, I think the other thing to note, and it gets to something Mr. Demling said that I should have mentioned earlier, is that um, our budget process generally takes about seven months. We start in October. So we've had to consolidate a $500,000 cut in about five weeks. Um, and so one of the things that we know as we head towards FY22 is we have to assume that things will be worse. I agree with Mr. Demling's point. Uh, and we'll have to spend a lot of next year really planning forward about structural changes that will need to happen. And so as we approached FY21, it was how do we get through this year um, so that we actually have the space and time to know, A, what schools will look like, and B, how we can restructure things, because we know that's going to have to happen. Um, and um, we knew if we tried to do that in a five-week span, uh, we would be really unsuccessful in, in being able to do that. So I do think the timing is a lot of it. I want to thank the principals and directors for, in, a, in an incredibly busy time, saying, how do we get to where we need to get to, and jumping in. Uh, with both feet to a really difficult conversation that we um, unfortunately had to have. Mr. Demling. 
Yeah, I mean, the other observation, so quick question, then a, a comment. Um, Dr. Slaughter, um, it, off the top of your head, I don't need the exact figure, but what's what's your estimate for uh, charter out um, total cost for, for this fiscal year? Can't even, <clears throat> sorry. Um, charter out this year, uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I forget what the number is. It, um, or just like ballpark for, the, for this year or? For a charter out, it's probably um, it's a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it's on the order of you know the same size as reduction in state support and and uh, you know that scale. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was I thought it was quite a, quite a bit more than that. I mean, the, the reason why I brought it up is that um, you know people and this is the comment um, is that. Um, you know, people ask me why I, I harp on charter school funding constantly, and it's because of this. It's because if you if you think about all of the money that we spend on charter school tuition, and you compare it to what we have to cut right now, and what we're going to have to cut next year, that that that's the reason for the urgency to look at charter school funding as part of the COVID crisis. It's not it's not opportunistic policy making. It's 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 absolutely essential because I, I you know I go back to a point that Dr. Morris made a couple meetings ago is that you know if we cut much further then we really got into the competitive advantage that we have in in this landscape right and you know so we, if we start cutting our art programs and and if we don't renovate the makerspace ever at the middle school if we uh, if our class sizes go up if if the sports uh, get significantly impacted if all those extracurriculars all the you know the the, the ap all all that extra stuff we invest in gets cut then we spiral down and lose more kids to to charter schools on and a formula that's so incredibly inequitable transfer of of funds, you know. And so when we think about big picture level adv advocacy, that's that's the reason why in the back of my mind I keep coming back to we need to get our state and local reps on board with the fact that you know if it's either now or never. Now by now I mean the next couple of years to to seriously look at um, trying to push some ball forward on state level change of charter school funding. Right, um, just a quick quick follow up. I'm, uh, you know, the number that I'm remembering is actually more like uh, 1.2 million. And that's probably more close because I'm yeah. thinking about, you know, sort of what our per pupil cost is times the number of kids. And that kind of puts us in that in that neck of the woods. I mean, you know, it's off that, but but yeah, it's a, it's a big number. Right, and just like if, if you compare that to, um, you know, it's, it's about 20K per kid, right? And so e even if, even if, the charter formula was half of net school spending <laughs> per pupil, right? You know, it's 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 the entire net school spending divided by your pupils. That's the charter formula. Even if it was half of that, that that would still cover all of these cuts. And so, um, you know, the order of magnitude is just shocking. And I, I I just really hope we can get some momentum, you know, locally and at the state level to to get some get some change moving on it. All right. There aren't further questions. Um, the next slide or the next page I'll scroll down to shows the assessments. This is going to be really small, so I apologize, but I'll I'll try to capture the big numbers so you see that we're we're essentially level funded, um, you know, in this budget uh, from last year to this year, um, and the numbers that people kind of care about uh, from the town perspective are at the bottom. We're still recommending the 45% method. Um, that was recommended, and I think there was tentative agreement from elected officials in the four towns. Uh, the assessments are quite different. So it's the, I don't know what this color is. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at colors. It's in between the blue and the purple. Um, olive, maybe? Um, <laughs> I don't know, sorry, it's probably not even close. Um, but, uh, but what you see for Amherst is they have actually a negative, um, about a quarter percent. Uh, from this year's assessment, Pelham's goes down a little over two percent. Leverett's goes up uh, about a third of a percent, and Shutesbury's goes down uh, a little more than five and a half percent. Um, these are all significant because they all are proportional, so they're significantly reduced from what was originally done. And, and just one note is, uh, you know, this this slide or, or this page shows the expected revenue sources, um, and you know, there was no way to predict where the 200,000 or whatever will end up being comes from. So uh, Dr. Slaughter added a note um, that, you know, it's reflected in the, the cuts required document uh, because we didn't want to 
actually hazard guesses on a public document of where how the state was going to go through this when they're telling us they're not going to know anything until uh, June or likely July. Um, so, you know, I think when this budget is all said and done and we actually have state information, we can go back and adjust that uh, that piece and, you know, even probably even like reduce a cut, but uh, that cut and, but, and make these numbers accurate. Uh, but this sort of wasn't a good way to do that. And I think Doug, you know, came up with the best way possible. Um, so before we go to capital, I just wanted to check in and see if there's any questions uh, on the uh, town assessment level. Ms. Spitzer? Have you had a chance to get any feedback on, on the new levels? I mean, any reason to think these will or will not be approved by the, the towns? So the town of Amherst came up with, uh, you know, some expectations at a public meeting that was Monday night this week. Uh, and we've been in touch, you know, actually we've been in touch quite a bit with the town of Amherst because the region comes in a little lower and Amherst, you know, another district I work for comes in a little higher, but it all sort of ends up in the wash or actually $2,000 is the good for the town of Amherst. Um, I think, you know, my sense is, you know, I had a quick conversation with Pell and we didn't get into this level of detail before this meeting because actually, when we end this this agenda item, I think we should talk about next steps in terms of engaging towns uh, in the discussion. You know, I haven't heard anything different from Shootsbury about, you know, their kind of bottom line negative 3% uh, and Leverett, this is a, a pretty significant reduction for, if you remember what was proposed before um, to getting to pretty close to level. Um, you know, uh, the towns aren't all being affected equally. Um, and uh, you know I'm going to be cautious with my language on that, but I think that's true because there's a different amount of basically the towns that are being most affected are the ones that are most reliant on state funds. Um, so if you look at uh, urban centers, things like that, where 80% of their budget comes from the state, they're the ones who are most concerned uh, or most likely to be affected. And our four towns don't have all the same percentage of funds coming from the state. So. Um, I think it's trying to be realistic with that. Um, I do think there's a reasonable budget. Other regions are also uh, coming up, or a lot of districts in general are saying level funding is sort of the best approach for this year to get through, and then you know we'll have to see where the chips fall in the future. Um, but it's certainly a conversation when we finish capital that I'd love some feedback and some thoughts about uh, how we should engage the four towns in this um, in the near future. I see no other questions. Um, I think I'll probably hand the capital side over to Dr. Slaughter, if that's okay, Dr. Slaughter. Certainly. Um, and in, in a similar vein, as far as the aesthetic of this, you know, things that are uh, highlighted in yellow are things that have changed and things that have uh, uh, a line through them have been essentially removed. Um, I could have highlighted them yellow, but then everything would be yellow. So uh, I didn't do that. Uh, things that are funded from uh, sort of a separate source, uh, like a revolving fund, uh, I left alone. Uh, I'll get into those uh, a little bit as I go through. But but largely, we went through uh, myself and the facilities director, Mr. Roy Clark, and, and uh, essentially sliced out almost everything that wasn't deemed uh, fairly essential in, in purpose and need. So uh, in the walk-in cooler and freezer, you see that that was 45000 previously. Uh, we've cut that down. We'll do one of the two. There's, you know, um, and I'm not recalling at the moment whether it's the freezer or the cooler. I think it's the cooler is a little higher need to have some repair done to it. Again, this is an essential uh, sort of function to to uh, have our lunch room in the in the high school work well, and so we do need to to spend that there. Um, we left the grounds improvements on the right. I'm kind of skipping around. I'm sorry to do that, but I want to talk about the 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 only big ask we have last. Um, the grounds improvements about taking down a a, 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 a temporary a temporary it's like 25 years later but a temporary building that was added onto the high school uh, a modular that's the word I'm looking for uh, needs to come down and and we still want to do that it's a, again a health and safety question uh, and then as we've labeled it here it's called COVID-19 needs uh, we know we will need to do some things related to public health uh, for the kids as well as the adults. Uh, in our schools, um, we're not exactly sure at this point, you know, what that precisely will be. 
uh, but we know the number's non-zero and it'll probably be fairly significant. The kinds of things we're going to need to do to, uh, you know, to make our spaces safer for kids and, and adults to be in school. And so we put in about $75,000 there. And really everything else uh, that would have required, um, you know, authorization and potentially borrowing from the four communities has been taken off the list. Um, we have, uh, you know, we'll be spending some of our time doing COVID things, which would prevent us from doing capital projects. Um, and then uh, we'll utilize any, you know, current funding we have that to finish up some projects if, if we have time for that. But uh, that really uh, encapsulates what, what we're doing here. Um, you know, there's some mechanics uh, that, that uh, Dr. Morris mentioned as far as we, uh, you guys, uh, when we met in March and passed the budget, we also passed, um, you know, the assessed amounts for, uh, for capital for the coming year. And uh, the, there's a 60 day clock that starts, which allows the, each of the four communities to, uh, to uh, essentially um, uh, schedule a meeting to say no if they wanted to, but if they don't do anything, it's an automatic yes. So essentially we've got the authorization in place for all of the things we were gonna do. Um, I think as a good faith me measure, we should probably rescind those uh, and then and then subsequently come back and, and ask for authorization for these things. It's a much, much smaller ask. Uh, it should be much more uh, manageable within people, with, within you know, member towns uh, budgets for the coming years. Um, and you know, the capital needs are still there. Um, and, and there's, uh, you know, and they're significant and, you know, they will be worse, uh, in future years. It's just the reality of, of the financial circumstances we're in that we're going to, to sort of, uh, dial these back to this level. Uh, one thing I didn't take off of this, which is, is probably also, uh, likely to be, um, scaled back and, and potentially, you know, shelved for some period of time is under field improvements. That's, uh, we, we've gone to the four communities and asked for uh, community preservation funds to help that uh, project get started. Um, so I didn't mark through it on this. I think each community can make their own choice. Uh, you know, if they wish to grant us that money, it's a separate funding source. Most of them have that sort of in the bank at the moment. Um, uh, they can, and we will, you know, cautiously use it and, and uh, and, and try to plan for that use, uh, you know, when it's appropriate and when we as a district can then uh, more fully sort of take on that project. But at the same time, if they were to, uh, you know, make a different decision uh, relative to that, that's that's uh, theirs to make. And, and, you know, it's likely that the, the field improvements we'd like to do are, are uh, potentially a little, little bit in the, in the future more than they were when we had this first conversation on that. So I just want to mention that that's there. We're not ignorant of the circumstances and, and recognize that it's likely that that, that line is likely to change significantly and how, how that capital project is going to play out over the next few years is going to be very different than what we originally envisioned. So uh, I did want to mention that. Um, so I think the short story is if you look at the far left, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, the amount of money that is legitimately going to be asked for financing is, is 115,000. Uh, basically, it's 100,000 for buildings, and in that buildings is $75,000 worth of COVID needs, and then $15,000 for for some grounds improvements, which is about taking down some modulars that are in uh, in pretty rough shape. And so, I think I'll stop there and let uh, anyone ask questions. And, and again, I've I've got my screen set up so I can't see. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, if you have a question, just speak up, or or Ms. McDonald might be able to to recognize you. Ms. Spitzer. So I have two two questions. First, if the if we're proposing the walk-in cooler, the COVID needs, and the grounds improvement, that adds up to 115000 for right. for financing. Yes. Not the hundred thousand that's on the sheet, is that right? Uh, the hundred thousand in the in the bottom of the middle column is just the buildings. So the total would be one hundred fifteen thousand for the right. Building. Okay. Right. right. So you just the ground right. on the on the right hand side. All right. Um. But the the other question I have is so I um I'm sure like many of us have been reading about COVID online and like, like there was an Aaron Bromage piece about airflow and when I and how spaces without good airflow are the most dangerous because of 
the way this disease travels. I'm not an expert on this at all. This is all my lay person, you know, just reading articles. Um, but when I see a cut to something like exhaust fans, that causes me some concern, even though it's not directly, you know, I don't understand the, these systems well enough to say whether or not that causes any concerns. Um, but as a lay person, it's, it's, it's raising a red flag for me. So I'm just asking this question to kind of understand better whether or not you think some of these cuts to the exhaust fans and I, I think the HVAC system that was AC for the summertime so that students could be in the summit academy space and since we're not probably having any students in any school in the summer I can see doing that but could you tell me whether or not you guys thought through it all those issues around um airflow in this these cuts that have, to my eyes look related but maybe they're not so I had a, a you know an extensive conversation with our facilities director, and we talked about that. and And I think that um, you know the the you know the fans that we have currently are functional and they work. They're they're nearing end of life, so it is the you know often the case with capital projects. You're you're sort of um, trying to understand the the sort of risk benefit of how likely is something going to mid year completely fail and and no longer work. But I think that. Uh, he was very confident that those fans would be uh, functional and 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 sufficient for the for the coming year. You know, it will be, um, you know, something that next year we wouldn't be able to push off. Um, so we had uh, it actually the total price of of those is a, is about ninety thousand dollars, and we had split it into two uh, this year. Uh, as, you know, as we did our initial round of, of thinking about capital for the region. So we'd already split it in two and we're thinking about, well, you know, it'd be nice to get started on that and then we'll pick up the rest of it the second year. Um, so I think that, you know, he was fairly confident we'd be, we'd be all right in that regard. Um, and so that, uh, that's what we're hoping for. I think also if, if um, you know, as we, as we go through this last month and a half of, of the current year, if there is a small bit of residual uh, monies available and we can get a uh, small bit of project work done uh, before June 30th on 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 those fans. We will, um, you know, I, I think the run, the thing we run into there is just you know how many days are there between now and the end of June. But but um, you know we'll be you know connecting and making a decision on that as as soon as possible. So if, if opportunity arises and we can execute on that before the end of the fiscal year, we will. But but I think the general feeling was we could we would be all right uh, for another year on that. Go ahead. So I, I guess I'm just concerned because of everything we just talked about, about the next year being even worse. And I don't see this issue going away if, until there's a vaccine or something. So I, I guess I would, if there's any way we could, this seems like the thing to, we should be investing in our capital projects to make the school safer for our kids. And um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on here that th this hurts a lot more. The cuts to the capital side, uh, the, the ones I'm seeing here, you know, the girls' lock, locker rooms, the maker space. I mean, the things we're seeing being cut here, all of them are really painful. So, um, but I think if they're, and like I said, the facilities director is going to know this better. But if there's an idea we're paying for this in a year from now, I just don't see that how that's going to happen. But if you guys have a, D Dr. Morris. Yeah, and I think this is a budget hearing, so this is exactly the kind of feedback we're looking for. So um, that's something that we can take back, and Dr. Slaughter can work with Mr. Roy Clark, and if it's the will of the committee, and there's a lot of nodding heads, frankly, when you were speaking. Um, I don't know if you can see them, but there were. Um, that's something that we can increase, and I think you know what's going to be incumbent on people uh, on the committee is when this goes to the towns that um, to be able to explain um, exactly what you just did, Ms. Spitzer, um, because what we know is um, I don't think you're going to get an argument from Dr. Slaughter, Mr. Roy Clark, or me on the points that you raise, because I think even if we can wait a year, I think I think you're spot on in your thinking. Um, and so I think it's really a decision, and I'm not saying we need to make this now, but it's a committee for the the it's a decision for the committee um, because you know we go to town meetings and we do some speaking or town council. At the end of the day, it does need to be the elected officials from those towns who. Um, have to advocate, um, and if that's how the committee's feeling, we certainly are happy to add that back into the capital budget. Ms. Seeger? Sort of on that note, I guess what I'm curious about is 
for the COVID-19 needs, I can totally understand that there's going to be some need, some things that need to be purchased to help work with that. I imagine a lot of them are short-term things like cleaners and whatnot. And by being new to this committee, I don't know what would fall under capital and what would fall under um, what, like your operating budget of cleaning supplies and whatnot. So I just, I can't imagine um, if cleaning supplies are a separate thing, like what would fall in the COVID-19 needs? Because things like um, what Ms. Spitzer mentioned about ventilation, to me, that would be like, yeah, that would that would kind of fit that bill. So if I don't know if you guys could talk about what might fall into that category, but that would be helpful to understand. Do you want to start, Dr. Slaughter, or do you want me to start? Go right ahead. Yeah, so these are things that, uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, short term, because, you know, maybe you're more optimistic than I am, which is good. I like when there are more optimistic people. Um, than I am, because I'm not sure I see them as, as super short term. Um, but what I've seen in terms of other places around the world that have opened, um, a doubling of hand washing stations. Um, so, so it's not supplies, it's truly infrastructure. Uh, plexiglass around people who work within six feet of each other, which at the high school and the middle school is actually not a small number of people. Uh, what we've seen is student desks, um, kind of like triptych, except they were cut off halfway through on student desks, um, so times, uh, you know, 1,400. Um, we've seen those type of things at play. Um, we've also seen in terms of buses, you know, that this is a really complicated one. I don't want to get too far into because then that starts getting into programming that we don't have a sense of, but that there may be some increased costs around transportation and, and what, what a bus rides look like and, and, and a number of things like that. So this isn't talking about sort of wipes and cleaners. This is actually... Uh, looking at places both in Asia and Europe in particular that are reopened, um, I'll be honest that in many of those places, the federal government in those countries have supported the infrastructure needs. I don't, I don't see obviously other than the CARES Act, which we're using to plug an operational budget, uh, where that sits in in our operational budget. Or um, and so those are the types of things we're talking about. Um, you know, and if anyone, any committee member is curious, I'm happy to send sort of links of some of it, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, is particularly at the secondary level uh, is acute is there's, there's not, it's not an elementary classroom where everyone can go wash their hands in the corner. You know, there's pretty, it's the bathrooms right now. That's not going to be sufficient next year. You know, whatever the situation is, we're going to need more places for kids to watch. And anytime you're dealing with getting water to a place that doesn't have water right now, it's really expensive, um, is the short story. So that's the type of of type of work. When we talked to Mr. Roy Clark, it's really hard to predict. Um, it's actually really hard to talk about because uh, it paints a picture of what school is going to look like that is really off-putting to many people right now. Um, and at the same time, if we don't plan for it and we get to August and we have to go back to the towns and say, "Hey, we actually need you know 15 more." Hand washing stations at the secondary level and piping to do it, and we need it before kids come back, and we're paying right, and that's the kind of situation we're trying to avoid. Uh, I don't think I don't see uh, a national effort around this. Um, you know, I think the mask question is another one that's out there. Um, we don't have clarity on. That's another one that people have a very emotional reaction to. Um, you know, we don't exactly know what's going to be expected. Um, but one can imagine if masks are going to be expected uh, for staff and particularly for students over the course of a year, um, we can't assume everyone's going to bring their own one. Right. All those types of things. So, you know, it is really hard to talk about. And maybe in the next version of this, we can delineate some of the general categories that I described without getting super specific because we don't have super specific plans. I mean, candidly, uh, they're not out there yet. Uh, but I think then it's really clear we're not talking about more wipes. Or something like that. Uh, we're talking we're truly about infrastructure pieces, which would, you know, I think uh, whether people are not uh, agree with funding it or not, it would logically fit into what we're talking about when we talk about capital expenses. Um, 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 Mr. Demling, you had your hand up, but I don't know, Ms. Seeger, is yours a follow up to your previous question? Yeah, I just want to say thank you, and I also want to say, like, I, yeah, I didn't mean short term. I don't think this is short term. I just oh, no, I, no, I didn't mean to pick on that. Quick, no, no, like quickly consumable things versus long term infrastructure. So thank you. You you answered yeah. my question. Thank you very much, Mr. Demley. Yeah, so just a general comment about things like the exhaust fans and the asbestos abatement and access control upgrade and the AC chillers. So 
I mean, I would echo a lot of what Ms. Spitzer said in that, I mean, all, these cuts are really hard to look at. Um, and, and they're all painful. And, and, and any other given year, we wouldn't be having a debate of whether we should start to replace the exhaust fans. <laughs> um, but it's obviously not a, a regular year. And um, I think the information that, that, that I'll need to make an informed vote next time is when we're talking about something like, for example, the exhaust fans, is it that this doing so would make the schools safer and more healthy? Or is it paying for that now would avoid uh, potential disruption and greater expense later? If it's if it's the first, then I think that's a compelling case. You know, if 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 the current fans are not filtering the air satisfactory satisfactorily, um, or or to to the degree that, that we need to in a COVID world, and new fans would, that that's one thing. If it's if it's a matter of well, we're kind of rolling the dice, and if um, on a good system that's working, um, and and we're risking uh, disruption and expense, I, th I think that's a second thing. And I think I think those are the kinds of things that we're going to have to swallow. You know, like I mean, we have a GCPC meeting next week, and I'm sure, you know, the the big theme is going to be, you know, you have to you know be ruthless about <laughs> cutting things off. Um, so again, I don't want to sound like I'm arguing against replacing the exhaust fans. We should replace the exhaust fans, but um, how we roll these things out, I think, is important. So that's you know, unrelated. I did have a question about the asbestos. Is because I think we've talked about this before. Is is this that we have an asbestos situation right now that we need to remediate in order to make the school safe, or is this regular work that we really ought to be doing on a regular basis? And that that's why that placeholder is there. Um, so it's it's kind of yes and yes to that. Um, there is there's regular asbestos abatement work you do. I mean, asbestos still gets used in uh, modern construction. You, you know, not that our buildings are that modern, but nonetheless, uh, it still gets used. You still have to manage and and, and abate uh, uh, abate that circumstance. Um, I think the thinking behind this, uh, there is also some some more immediate concerns uh, around some tile uh, in the in the high school building. Um, where most likely the mastic or the, the glue that holds them down might have some asbestos in it. Um, and so the, there is a small, we, we often ask for asbestos abatement money most every year in capital. And so I, uh, Mr. Roy Clark felt that there was a sufficient amount to remediate any uh, urgent or emergent needs relative to that. So I think he felt comfortable. I mean, obviously, you know, I, he wouldn't have put on the list in the first place if he didn't want the whole amount and could use it. Uh, but he felt that with with money that he has in hand from previous capital and uh, some small scale adjustment, probably not as pretty as what we'd like to do relative to some tile replacement, but functional, uh, he could uh, keep that from being a health risk as well. And so one thing that I'm taking from the conversation and given JCPC and Amherst is coming up. Um, so one thing I'll ask Dr. Slaughter to do is work with Mr. Roy Clark and, and add a little narrative section to the changes. Um, so that uh, for all towns that they can do that, um, have that in hand before your vote next time so that uh, the COVID piece will be better explained and the exhaust fans, whether it gets added back or not, but there'll be, um, you know, a small section that explains uh, with some narrative to that. So uh, I'll trust Dr. Slaughter will be able to work on that with Mr. Roy Clark. Okay, any other questions? Dr. Morris. So the last thing on this topic is just um, what role do you want uh, us to play in terms of the four member towns? Um, you know, we, we presented that second page of that document. I'll turn this off, actually. We presented that second page of the document so that everybody had access to all the options that were discussed. We proposed 45%. We had tentative agreement from our member towns elected officials on that uh, in March. We're staying with that same recommendation, but we didn't want to not show you all the different versions of the new budget. Um, so, you know, there's a number of different options you have. We could we could email this document or email particularly the, the option that, um, well, let me frame it differently. So uh, we're looking to come back for a vote two weeks, uh, a little less than two weeks, actually, Tuesday the 26th. Um, and so the question is, um, is there, what do you need or what would you like us to do in advance of that meeting um, in terms of the member towns? Um, 
Are there things that you would like to do from a committee member point of view? Are there things uh, from the district staff that you'd like us to reach out to member towns? Um, you know, if there's anything we can do that would be helpful, that's great. If there's any materials you need to, uh, that you want to reach out to, to folks in your communities, that'd be helpful. Um, we just wanted to have a conversation so that we have a, we have a plan moving forward in advance of the 26th. Mr. Demling? So I'm, I'm wondering if, if it would help um, the superintendent and um, our finance director if, if, if our committee ex expressed our general feeling about which of these options we wanted to recommend um, so that when they, if, if Dr. Morris or Dr. Slaughter are sitting down with uh, the finance committee, the Amherst Town Council or the select board of Leverett Pelham, whatever, um, they can say, well, we discussed this uh, and the regional school committee uh, you know, expressed that they would like to go with, you know, column X, column Y, column Z, um, to, add, to, to add a little more certainty to where the school committee is, is feeling. Um, I, I mean, I, I would be comfortable with, with having that discussion right now. Um, uh, Dr. Slaughter, Dr. Morris, do you feel like that would be a helpful piece of information to, to give a little more like uh, grounding, a little more teeth to your dis to dis your discussions, if, if that's what we're asking you to do. <laughs> Dr. Slaughter. So um, just to talk about the mechanics a little bit of things, which I I I, I would strongly uh, appreciate that conversation personally. I, I think uh, Dr. Morris will as well. And here's the reason why: you guys will vote on the 26th, if I'm doing the math right, uh, to for a budget. The other thing is that. You know, we know that town meetings won't happen until very, very late in June, and therefore we'll hit July 1. Um, and so uh, with potentially maybe or maybe not a, a, a budget, so we'll, we'll be submitting one full budget to the state. Uh, that documentation is due June 1st. And one of the critical pieces of that, if we're using an alternative assessment method, is a letter of um, affirmation, for lack of a term, relative to the assessment method. Uh, and an understanding that if the budget then fails uh, by, you know, when the media, you know, town meeting vote or the council, the budget fails, it'll drop to a statutory method. Um, so the timeline between Tuesday and the following Monday, uh, we need select boards to, you know, know what they potentially would be voting on uh, for an assessment method and then crafting a letter uh, supporting that. Um, so I think there's just some timing and, and mechanics type of thing there. Um, you know, technically they could meet and vote on that earlier, but if, if the school committee would, would express an opinion, that would be, I think, uh, very, very helpful. Ms. Seeger. So I don't have the documents from the last four town meeting in front of me. Do you have a sense of what the changes for the towns? Um, I mean, for us going from a level funded to increasing by 5,000, um, you know, in any other year, I think is fairly fairly small and this coming year it's like yeah you know we're the one town who's who's actually increasing that being said it's about 5500 so i'm just curious of before i think it was in the 40k range for leverett do you know offhand uh, i can try to look that up for you but it's, it's significantly less than it was mm -hmm. uh before but um, that's certainly a document we could pull up if not right now that to give you so that in conversations with leverett they could see that it's there's been a real acknowledgement for, for all four towns that we're reducing them and we're reducing them on an even level consistent with 45% yeah. method. But that's a great point, thank you. Yeah, I would love to bring them that information. Um, mm -hmm. And I know our next select board meeting is is May 26th. So um, you know, I'd love to get a sense of what they think, but we'll see how that goes. Any other comments? Um, um, Mr. Demling? Um, I mean, so I'll just say for my part, I, I think the simplest route um, and probably the most pragmatic is for our committee to express either, either formally through a vote right now or just informally through um, comments from, from members. Um, I, I think it makes more sense to stay with the 45% statutory column. It's 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 the most reflective of what the 
consensus was at the last four towns meeting. Um, we're not in a practical situation to be get, running around the four towns and having a bunch of individual and group conversations or another four towns meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and the values are not, um, uh, you know, wildly uh, unpleasant for, for any one town. I don't want to um, say that the, these aren't difficult to, uh, to fund for any town, you know, qu quite the contrary in the current situation, but it's, it's, it's not like there's one town that goes up seven or eight percent, you know, it's, um, uh, I, I think I think it's the most digestible given what the expectations were before. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm comfortable, you know, expressing a, a recommendation for the 45 percent. Um, but but I, th I think it would be good if um, if we had some sort of expression of group consen consensus on that. I agree. I think um, uh, just following up. A technicality. I think if um, having this uh, spreadsheet um, as a separate handout, but then also noting noting on that same spreadsheet what the prior budget was that we had approved. I think getting to Ms. Seeger's question, also mm -hmm. I think will help. Um, you know, show the show the sort of we went from here to here to here, um, so that even where it's looking like an increase, it. it it's clear that it's, it's much, much different than what we were talking about before. And I, and I think that that can also serve to reinforce what I think what you were suggesting, Mr. Deming, that we, we had all agreed to the 45% method before um, and we're supporting the idea to, to, to continue with that in this, in this new budget. Um, and this is what the implications are. Mr. Menino. How do we express our approval of the 45% uh, method? Um, I suppose we could take a vote if uh, folks are, I'm seeing heads nodding. So um, does somebody want to make a motion? Mr. Menino, would you like to make a motion? I move that the committee approve the adoption of the 45% assessment method. Moved by Menino. Um, I'll second that, second by McDonald. Um, so we'll, do, uh, we'll go roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Um, so could I could I ask a question before we vote? Would that be okay with the chair? Um, any further discussion on this? Yes, Mr. Demling. <laughs> um, so just I just want to be clear about what exactly what Mr. Menino's motion is. Are we is it is this technically approving the assessment method like we kind of do every year, and or, or or are we just sort of expressing our general support so that? Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris have their marching orders. Like, are we gonna, you know what I mean? Are, 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 we, are we just giving, are we just putting a little more teeth to like, yeah, yeah, 45% or is this the actual assessment method vote? Uh, Ms. Menino, you? This was a general expression of support, not meant as a commitment. Dr. Slaughter, did you want? Uh, yeah, I think that to do the formal vote would require very specific language, um, which we have adopted at your previous. So, you know, it is sort of in place in some respects, but you probably want to vote that again. Um, but it does have very particular and specific language you have to use for that. So this would almost have to be, and we'll have that language for, for next time. Right, yeah. Um, Dr. Morris. You're muted, Dr. Morris. My apologies. Um, I do have the Ms. Ms. Seeger's question. It might be relevant before you vote. I do have the uh, grid of the past budget and the town assessments. Um, so I can display that, I believe, right now. Yep. So I'll try to make it larger. And again, it's that color that I'm struggling, but it's it's these numbers where Amherst was going up 2.16, Pelham was going up 0.15%. Lever was going up 2.75% and Shootsbury was going down 3.15. Uh, and certainly Dr. Slaughter can send, you know, um, the, the numbers that are being proposed by the district tonight, uh, as well as this document as well, so people can see the comparison. But um, I thought it'd be relevant to take a look at it before you voted. So if you keep that there, I'd be happy to read the different numbers. So um, Amherst previously was 16.8 million the new um, revised is 16.4 million. Pelham, 
previous was 913,000 um, proposed is 891.9. Leverett previous was 1.5 million. Uh, new proposed is 1.5 million. Um, Shootsbury, or sorry, 1.47. Um, Shootsbury prior was 1.7 million and current proposal is 1.67. So at our next at our next meeting where we will be taking a vote on the regional budget, we'll also be taking a vote on the assessment method. So tonight, what we're the motion that's in front of us is to sort of agree and um, concur with the proposal to um, proceed with the forty five percent method. Any more discussion on the motion? Seeing none, um, uh, Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord abstain. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Pitzer. Pitzer, aye. Um, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So that motion passes eight, yay, uh, zero, no, and one abstain. Okay. Um, we don't have anything more on budget and we'll move on to the next order um, item, which is our superintendent evaluation and incident. Um, Ms. Pitzer, would you like to order? Um, so I reached out to Debbie Westmoreland, who um, in the past has created a survey monkey document. Um, I'm talking it's not the right word. Um, <laughs> a survey monkey instrument um, in order for us to evaluate the superintendent. So my update on this, um, unfortunately, I don't think we can approve the instrument. Is that I have um, received a PDF of the old version, and I'm in the process of reaching out and getting the access or delegating that job to somebody. I mean, administratively who can who can take care of it but i'm in the process of getting us um moving on having an instrument um i think the the relevant question for the superintendent evaluation is the timing of it and whether or not we need to um have a, a vote on not the instrument itself but on moving the evaluation out um for a little bit longer after the guidance we received from council. I think originally um, we had hoped that, um, I think we had thought it was before July 1st was the deadline, but the council suggested June 1st based on the date in um, Dr. Morris's contract. Um, so I would just say that at the next meeting, if not this one, I think we need to have, have a, a vote on that if we want to do it at a later date. Agreed. Um, so at the, at our next meeting on the 26th, um, we'll look at the, at the final instrument, um, and we'll, um, review and vote on a new timeline for the evaluation. That sounds good. Yep. Yeah. And we'll have to confirm that the superintendent is, um, also in agreement with the extension on the timeline too. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Any um, questions or, or thoughts from the committee on this? No. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item then. Um, this is a COVID-19 school update. Dr. Morris? I'll be brief on this, just given the time and that there's other agendas still to go, items still to go. Um, so a couple things that... Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had a budget meeting, superintendents in Western Mass had a budget meeting 
Uh, appreciate that our state legislators were present for it. Um, Friday afternoon, late afternoon, uh, it was very kind of them to jump in. They also invited some members of the education committee, uh, which was helpful. They were in a Western Mass space. One was Eastern Mass and one was Central Mass, but they wanted to hear about the superintendent experience and the school district experience um, during COVID and some of the financial pieces as well. So um, Joe Comerford was pretty central in organizing that. So I wanna thank our state Senator for that. Also wanna thank our state Senator. So something Dr. Brady in particular, and I've just been supporting uh, in a supporting role is advocacy around um, some funding challenges that have come up and, and not getting in the weeds, but they're related to special ed reimbursements uh, for students uh, during this time because services service delivery looks really different. and. Uh, Desi was um, being a stickler for reimbursements that had to be about service delivery instead of um, the full range of offerings during a crisis. And uh, we got an email from Joe that she that we will look to see something. Uh, we don't know exactly know what it'll look like, but um, that she, her advocacy has um, you know um, made a difference um, and and or she hopes. Um, so it's not a public thing. I don't actually not even a private thing. I don't exactly know what that looks like. At this point, but I, I doubly want to thank uh, our state senator for her advocacy. She set up a conference call between Dr. Brady, myself, and Senator Lewis. And Senator Lewis is the chair, co-chair of the education committee at the state, uh, to express some of the nuances of special ed, particularly districts like ours who have in-district special ed programs. Um, you know, some of the guidance that we received from Desi sort of was all focused on out-of-district special ed programs and didn't really reflect uh, a lot of our internal programming that we have uh, at the regional level. Uh, uh, we have groups formed uh, and they're starting to meet next week uh, around planning for fall. Um, this is on the positive assumption that we're back in school in some way, shape or form. So there's a group uh, looking at a secondary specific group looking at instructional planning. Uh, we're looking at social emotional planning, facilities and school operations planning, uh, technology, uh, communication, athletics clubs and before and after school care, family outreach, staff support. There's a governance group so that these groups weren't, uh, aren't working in silos. We also added, based on staff feedback, a distance learning group that if uh, the unfortunate situation emerges and we are um, in a different, uh, in a similar boat that students aren't and staff aren't coming to school, um, trying to think about what we've learned this year, doing everything in a rush and what would we do the same and what's working and what would we do differently next year. So those groups are gonna meet for the next five weeks. They're gonna develop guiding principles, right? Not detailed plans, but guiding principles, which are uh, essentially statements of what we will do. For instance, we might say, uh, we will address the learning needs that have emerged out of being out of school for five and a half months um, and, and have a certain language. Uh, we'll be taking those out and shopping those with the larger community as well as all staff members to get feedback on those because the reality is we're not going to receive guidance, real guidance. Uh, I wouldn't anticipate till the summer, uh, but having guiding princess principles lets us actively start planning and lets us be agile with whatever the, um, whatever the feedback we get from public health authorities. Uh, so I think the, geez, we're up to um, between those 10 groups, probably 80, 90, probably a little more staff members who have volunteered to do that. Um, it's great to have their voice in the conversation. And I think the last thing I'll share, and I'll do a screenshot of it because it's better than just me talking it through, is just about high school graduation and our high school seniors. Um, and I think this is it. Yeah. Um, so you'll see that uh, we are having high school seniors let out of class uh, about a week earlier than they typically would have. Um, and there's gonna be a virtual town hall with Principal Jones uh, to celebrate that moment. Uh, on Tuesday the 26th, they'll say goodbye to the halls of the high school. Um, we have a very, and Rupert Wright Clark's been working with Principal Jones about this, how to do this in a physically distanced way. Uh, we are not generally allowing students in our, high, in our schools in general, based on the guidance, there is exceptions for high school seniors. Um, so this pack, caps and gowns, senior awards, uh, cleaning out lockers, personal items, uh, it's all being done in a way that uh, in time slots um, with adult volunteers, um, staff volunteers there uh, to manage that uh, process. Uh, graduation itself in the way we're doing it will happen on May 27th. It's literally a day-long procession. I think it's eight to five uh, because what students, what we heard from students in particular and students and families uh, was that walking across a stage, not a virtual stage, but a physical stage was the most important thing. Uh, so working from a public health perspective, we're able to do that. Uh, the stage will be outside. We're not meeting at Mullins, so uh, we're, it's just not going to rain that day. Um, and uh, students and families are able to walk across the stage, uh, you know, very few people at a time. 
People can be in their cars, honk their horns. Um, staff members as well will take professional photos and video. We want to thank Amherst Media for being a partner with us on that. Um, students are assigned to hourly groups alphabetically, uh, and it's very well organized and well structured. So thanks for folks who have been working on that uh, nonstop for the last few weeks. Um, Amherst Media then is going to take that plus um, the speeches that would happen typically from the principal, school committee chair. Now we know who that'll be. Um, so thank you, Ms. McDonald, uh, myself, uh, and valedictorian, and salutatorian, and all those pieces. Uh, and kind of class present, that's going to be recorded. Um, and Amherst Media through Video Magic is going to make it all seem like it's not an eight to five event. So I want to be really clear: the video will not be um, will not be nine hours long. Um, it'll be condensed, and it'll make it feel as much as possible like it was uh, it was the live event that we'd want it to be because it is a live event. It's just happening almost in slow motion from a physical distinct per distinct perspective. So. You know, we have 230 something like that graduates. It's not we're not a little school that can do that easily. So it's taken intensive amount of planning. Um, and one of the things I got the most feedback, positive feedback about from families, is that it's going to be aired on Amherst Media. People are very sick of looking at their computer screens, and even though it's just a different screen, the fact that it's not streamed, it's you know, I mean, it eventually will be available that way. But um, that people can watch it on Amherst Media on their television, uh, if they so choose, is not a small thing. Uh, for many folks. Um, so, so we're really excited about the plan that's been developed. We think it honors uh, what we heard from students. The student council's been heavily involved in that planning. Uh, I won't show you the next page because of student initials, but you'll see the detailed 15 minute or tiny little slots where people come and it's really well orchestrated um, in terms of that. And again, a huge thank you to Amherst Media for stepping up and contributing to making this whole thing work. Because if we didn't have Amherst Media, I don't, I don't see how this would have played out. So. Um, that is my COVID update for tonight. Any questions for Dr. Morris? Not seeing, oh, Mr. Menino? Thank you for organizing such a celebratory event. Thank you, really. It's, it's Principal Jones, Dr. Gramacki, Mr. Sadiq. Um, and a lot of the students have been just heavily involved. So uh, really, I'll, I'll take that credit, but I'll, I'll return it back to them because that's where it really belongs. I've been just the one on the public health side connecting with people. Um, you know, that's an easier job. Um, Mr. Sullivan. A quick question on those poor seniors who couldn't take the... Um... Oh, you got... You got muted. Oh, how are a question about the poor seniors who couldn't do the MCAS because they were canceled? How, yeah, so, you know, where, so where do they stand as far as being able to try and get it done? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'll take a step back and then a step forward. So the way it works is that uh, MCAS exams are a competency, uh, competency determination a factor. So in other words, you have to receive a passing score at the high school level in Massachusetts to receive a diploma. Uh, there are retakes for students who are not successful in passing them. And however, there are students who could not take a retake uh, this spring because it wasn't possible. Uh, out of those students, we looked at how many students were on pace to graduate in terms of the number of credits they earned at the high school. In other words, you need two things to be able to graduate. You need to pass MCAS, you need to pass enough courses to have enough credits to graduate. There is a small group of students, I'm not gonna say the number, but it can count on one hand, who fit in a category where they had the credits but didn't have the MCAS. And uh, the State Board of Education last week, I wanna say, uh, created a competency, determin pa competency determination pathway uh, that would not involve it passing an MCAS. I'll be on a conference call on that tomorrow afternoon along with Dr. Brady and Principal Jones uh, to try to find out more. So uh, the timing is really tight, right? School ends for those students very soon. Uh, but we're optimistic that there's flexibility. I think it, it, the, literally the number of students it might affect is one or two, but for those one or two, two students, this is, this is a huge deal for them. So we have been advocating and will uh, continue to, uh, for students, uh, Mr. Sloven will also be on that call, I should say as well, uh, principal of Summit Academy. Uh, so we, we've been, we have been and will continue to advocate for students who will um, have the local requirements, but not the MCAS, and that uh, help them to walk on the 27th. Uh, and I think the state has, has created a glide, plan, a glide, way, a glide path for us to be able to do so. Um, so I want to say I'm deeply appreciative because it took um, 
took a board action at the state level to create that. Um, and uh, again, for that small group of students, we're going we're gonna to get them over the finish line. Uh, for other students who had issues on the credit side, they're likely to be able to finish over the summer uh, using the same methodology. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything. Oh, great. Um, I will just comment, uh, having seen a, a few of those elementary school uh, teacher parade, teacher and staff parades that brought tears to my eyes, I can only imagine that um, lots of Kleenex is going to be needed for that, um, that car parade on, on June 5th. So um, looking forward to that. Um, Moving on to the next item, which is a consideration of a draft resolution for um, request for increased federal funding. And um, I'll turn this over to Mr. Demling, who kindly um, helped draft this uh, resolution. Do you want to introduce it? Sure. Uh, so this is something that um, I saw come across the, the Mass Association of School Committee's mailing list. Um, Tr Tracy Novick, who's awesome, you should follow her if you want to advocate for anything uh, in Massachusetts education funding wise um, shared this this is um, copied uh, modified version of a resolution that the Boston School Committee uh, passed so it's it's the same uh, whereas resolved kind of motion format um, and about half the content is is verbatim that talks about uh, what happened 10 years ago during the recession and whatnot um, and it basically lays out the case for what what is happening with public schools now and so what's happening with us specifically and so i took the um you know the boston specific information and made it specific to amherst pelham regional um talked a little more about um the impact to local municipalities and in, in the state that they're also in, in the same boat um and then the, the this and so the so the first half of the the resolution really talks about what what our school has been doing so in terms of keeping people employed and uh, supporting uh, families through the, the Wi-Fi technology and meals um, uh, and just um, how uh, on the second page comparing to what happened in the recession um, in 2009 where uh, there was a national investment of 100 billion followed by another 10 billion uh, compared to today where by all rights this is a far uh, more serious and impactful economic situation uh, and they've only passed 13 billion for um, for federal funding. And so uh, there are national organizations like the NEA, American Federation of Teachers, National School Board Association, uh, American Association of School Administrators, National PTA, uh, our uh, our teachers association MTA has been has been really trying to make some noise about this. And it's all about um, what Dr. Morris has mentioned several times, which is if we don't get serious national funding. Uh, then all public schools in our state and across the country are going to be in a world world of hurt. So um, it just sort of lays out that case. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the practical impact, I, I think these um, these kinds of acts are are twofold. One, one, it's about raising public awareness. Uh, you know, there's a lot of facts here that not everybody knows who doesn't follow uh, education funding. Uh, but it's also to to put a fine point in the public consciousness and media about the urgency. Uh, to fund public schools, um, and it's also to give some support to our representatives. You know, we're very fortunate that uh, everything that our national uh, senators and congressional um, delegation has has said about this has been very positive and supportive. Uh, but you know, but they need they need wind behind their back as well, right? You know, so if they get, you know, hundreds of school committees and organizations all saying the same thing, it makes it that much easier for them to to advocate and to get attention for it from their colleagues. So. It's just a first draft. Um, uh, again, half the content is from the Boston School Committee. So thank you very much to, uh, to them for putting that together. And, um, you know, we can, I don't think there's a, a super urgency to pass this like right now. I mean, we're going to meet in a couple of weeks. Um, so any input anybody has, uh, you know, we can certainly take that, incorporate it, and make it uh, expressive of, of everybody's um, thoughts on the matter. Ms. Spitzer. I just want to thank you, Mr. Dumling, for putting this together. Um, I agree it may not 
make you know big waves but if it starts you know it's a little bit of something and it, everybody in the all the other school committees you know take a similar step then and maybe it'll become a big wave so um thank you and i'd be happy to look it over um i'd also um be happy to vote on it tonight so. Would it be possible, Peter, to send a copy of that to all of us? Yeah, so it went out this morning. Um, I think Sasha sent it out to, to everyone. I don't know if it got updated in the, the last packet document that included everything, but it did, it did go out this morning. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I, I think um, I'll just comment again, like, Thank, thank you, Mr. Dimling, for doing the work and, and Dr. Slaughter for, for providing a lot of input on the numbers that are included in here. Um, the, we talked at the, our last meeting about um, you know, whether we wanted to do advocacy, and I, I do feel um, similar to what Ms. Spitzer said, is that you know, while us alone, um, us you know, passing a resolution alone, um, it may not really move the needle um, if we're part of a movement of school committees across the state and across the nation that are doing this, then that actually becomes something that you can't not notice um, and not listen to. So um, so I, I do support this. Um, but I, I think I'm hearing that not everybody's had a chance to read through this. So. Um, so un unless folks are feeling really antsy and want to vote for it tonight, um, I'm gonna suggest that we um, take the time to read it um, and provide any further comment um, or input to Mr. Demling over the next two weeks, and then we'll come back and vote on this at their next meeting. Does that, does that work for everybody? Okay, great. And... Next, we have um, warrants, and I'm not sure if we should uh, change the language on our agendas from approve warrants because we're not actually approving them. They've been approved, and we're hearing a report on them. Um, so, uh, Ms. Spitzer, I believe you're our designated warrant signer. Yes, I am for now. Um, so, just bear with me because there have been a lot of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be trying to read this on my screen. So. Um, I authorized $1,121.73 for a warrant dated March 15th, um, sorry, April 4th, <laughs> April 15th, two, 2020. And that was signed on May 5th, 2020. Um, I authorized payments in the amount of $4,562.50 for a warrant dated April 15th, 2020. And that again was signed on May 5th. I authorized um, payments in the amount of $739,048.72 for a warrant dated April 29th, 2020. That was on May 5th as well. I authorized payment for a warrant in the amount of $736,161.50 for a warrant dated April 15th, 2020. Um, again, that was on May 5th. So this was a little complicated. I um, authorized by my signature, um, Voiding a payment of one thousand one hundred twenty-one dollars and seventy-three cents. Um, that was on April fifteenth, and I signed that on May fifth, May fifth as well. Um, I authorized a warrant in the amount of two hundred sixty thousand sixty-two dollars and eighty-seven cents for a warrant dated um, March twenty-seventh, two thousand twenty, and that was not done on April. 10th, um, the details are, it was general fund expenses of $248,121.44 um, for the revolving fund expenses of $8,814.29. Um, 
and grant fund expenses of $2,213.23 and other funds in the amount of $913.91 for senior high school gifts. I authorized um, by my signature a warrant in the amount of $141,139.76 for a warrant dated April 1st, and that was all for general fund expenses on April 10th. Um, I authorized a payment in the amount of $675,187.05 for a warrant dated April 15th, 2020, and that broke down to the um, general fund expenses of $674,738.85 and grant fund expenses of $433.20, and that was signed on April 17th. On, um, sorry, I authorized by my signature um, a warrant in the amount of $453,866, sorry, $453,866.41 for a warrant dated April 22nd. 2020, and that broke down to include general fund expenses of $434,757.75, $16,567.41, $2,541.25 in grant fund expenses, and I'm sorry, the prior one was for revolving fund expenses, and that was all signed on April 26th, final one, I believe, uh, on April 29th, I authorized by my signature payments in the amount of $388,719.95 for um, general fund expenses of $388,512.21 and revolving fund expenses of $207.74 and that was signed on May 4th. And that is all. Any questions from, no? Okay. Um, next, we do have a couple of gifts um, next on our agenda. Does anybody want to volunteer to make a motion? Um, if not, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I move uh, that we accept the following gifts from Dean's Beans Organic Coffee Company, number 13388, to support the district meal program in the amount of $2,000. And to, from Anonymous number 560-202-9190 to support arms at principal discretion in the amount of $10. And the from Friends of ARPS Performing Arts number 313 per Susan Rupp to support donation for student activities musical account in the amount of $7,763.70. For a total of $9,773.70. I'll second. Move by McDonald's second by Caesar. Any, any discussion, comment? Seeing none, we'll vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer? Dancer, aye. And Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Passes uh, unanimous 9 0. Um, since we have Ms. Dancer on the phone now, um, I'm wondering if the committee is um, 
would like to move back before we move into future planning um, on to consider um, the vice chair nomination. Um, and Ms. Stancer, we lost you and um, you uh, was moved by myself and seconded, um, I believe by Ms. Seeger um, to nominate you for vice chair. And we were in the process of asking if you are open to that nomination. Uh, yes, I am. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Seeing none, um, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Manino. Manino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Answer aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, you, uh, voted uh, unanimously, 9-0. Mr. Demling. I just wanted to say thank you to both for taking on what is a significant job, and we will all do our best to support you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stancer. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, future planning. So um, we mentioned our next meeting. Uh, Dr. Morris, I don't know if you have access to that table that you could share on the screen, but our next meeting is... Um, would, would you like me to display that? Yes. Okay, sure. Um, I don't think it's a lot in the grid, but it's helpful sometimes to see the visual. <laughs> You've been updating it as we went, so that's great. <laughs> so as mentioned, our next meeting um, is Tuesday the 26th. Um, we have, uh, again, the COVID-19 school update, our budget and assessment method vote for FY21, um, a vote on our draft resolution for increased federal funding, a warrant review, and the superintendent evaluation instrument and timeline discussion and agreement. Are there any ads? Allison, did you mention the vote on the assessment method? Um, I thought I did, but um, yes, that's also on there. FY21 budget and assessment method. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Spitzer, you had a comment? I would just... Uh... If it's important, note that it will be a vote for the timing of the superintendent evaluation, likely. Great. Those are all meaty topics. Um, any, <laughs> any, any ads? News? No. Great. Okay, um, so I believe now we're moving into executive session. I, I need to make this motion and, and speak this motion. Is that correct? Yeah, um, okay. So I um, move to adjourn to executive session with no plans to return to open meeting for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, APEA, UFCW, Five Star and Kuzmeskis, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public, public body and the chair so declares. Reference MA Mass General Law Chapter 30A Section 21A3. Um, and this uh, is has to be a roll call vote. Uh, uh, Mr. Demley? So I, I think technically you also have to declare. It's like, it, so you just said if the chair so declares? Oh, so, so, then, so then you say, yes, I declare. Okay. And I declare. <laughs> Thank you. Learn, learning on the job. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ms. Sneaker? Does it need a second or is it so declared? I'm going to look to my, my friends with Robert Rules. Uh... Yeah, I think if you move to adjourn, then it does need a second. Okay. Okay, I'll second. 
moved in second and great. Um, so, Mr. Demling. Hi, Demling I. Mr. Harrington. Harrington I. Ms. Lord. Lord I. Mr. Menino. Menino I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan I. And McDonald I. We are now adjourned and moving into executive session.